just to get rid of the minuses out in front of the stuff. <clears throat> and then we need to get rid of the square root. So what gets rid of a square root? A square. A square. So we're going to square both sides. So 16 minus x is equal to 25. Subtract the 16. Divide by negative 1. Or multiply by negative 1. The x is equal to negative 9. So your x-intercept is like way over here on the negative x's. Somewhere around in there. So you can draw it kind of like that. <laughs> Okay, it's like, or you can wait to draw it until you know what these numbers are, and then you can kind of draw it to kind of fit what you're doing. Because again, it's not drawn to scale. So I mean, you can draw it just like that if you wanted to. Just make sure you label stuff. Because I'm not measuring. You're going, well, that nine should have been way over there. It's like that. As long as you have the right values, the right shape, that's that's good enough. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Let's move on to stuff from exam two. So this was pretty much mostly trig. So being able to graph the trig functions, finding the amplitude and the period, uh, using the trig identities. Um, there was some vector stuff that was thrown in there in chapter nine, um, but most of it dealt with trig of some sort. <laughs> so one of the questions on the exam that people seem to miss was it wanted you to rewrite an expression. And one of them had a cosine in it and the other one had a sign. Pull it up. Uh, but both of them required you to use uh, a double angle identity on them. Okay. So yeah, it was multiple choice and I was like, okay, which of the following <laughs> expressions is equivalent to Uh, cosine of four theta. <clears throat> so had I asked this one, what's equivalent to cosine of two theta, most people could probably do it because they would just spit out one of three identities. So two cosine squared minus one, one minus two sine squared. And then cosine squared minus sine squared. So those are that would be your three, or those would be your three options. But we're asked for cosine of four theta. Well, these identities are still gonna apply. Um, but one of the things that people want to do or think they can do is they see that four in there and they think that they can like pull the four out. <clears throat> uh, 
um, or it changes A2 to a four. And that's not the case. The identities are kind of locked into place. The only thing that you can alter are the angles themselves. Any coefficient, any exponents stay exactly as they appear in the formula. That's why it's a formula. Um, if this number out here could change, it would have to be like two theta or two X or something to say, hey, yeah, we can change this around. But this two is locked into position. You cannot change it. Same with the exponent, same with the one. They're just there to stay. So what you do is you got to notice the pattern that's happening. So in the original formulas, you're going from two theta to just thetas. So how do you go from a two theta to one theta? What are you doing to the angle? What are you doing to two theta to make it just theta? What arithmetic operation are you doing? Well, like when you solve for cosine two theta, usually. Like but no, 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 don't, don't solve for it. Just when you go from, if, what are you doing to two theta to make it equal one theta? What do you have to do over here to make it equal to one? Divide it by two. Divide it by two, there you go. That's how you go from this expression to one of these. You divide the angle, oops, the angle by two. So what's four theta divided by two? Two theta. Two theta. And that's it. And that was one of the choices. And so that was the one to choose. <laughs> the other one that we had was sine of eight theta. Some people had that problem. Well, you're doing the same thing. You gotta divide the angles by two. So it's still gonna be a two out in front that's part of the formula. And then sine of fourth theta, cosine of theta, cosine of fourth theta. So don't change any coefficient, don't change any exponent. It's the angles themselves that are being adjusted. Okay, so for this one, the sine of eight theta, that wasn't where you could stop. That wasn't one of your choices. The cosine of four theta, that one was in one of them. So we can keep that. But your sine of four theta, you can break it down again. That would be two sine of, take four theta divided by two. Cos theta. And then just take these two here and then you can just multiply them together. Okay, any questions on either of these? All right. Okay, let's move on to number eight. And this one was asking about the number of zeros that a function would have. So one of them had sine, the other one had cosine. So the one with sine was e to the x sine x. So how many zeros does that function have over the interval? From zero to two pi, but you're not including the two pi. <clears throat> so if I want to know how many zeros you have, whoops, 
you're taking the equation or the function and you're setting it equal to zero and then you're trying to solve it. So when you go to solve this, uh, there's nothing that you can really do to manipulate it. You're just sort of stuck with it. So technically it's factored. So you're figuring, figuring out where the e to the x is zero, and then you're also solving for where sine of x is zero. So where does e equal zero? At one. Wait. Yeah. So e to the first is zero. Because that's what that would mean. If you're saying x is one, then you're saying if you plug one into that exponent, you're going to get zero. It doesn't sound right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nope. So e to the x, that never equals zero. So that can't be solved. Because um, e to the x is always, uh, like if you graphed it, e to the x is always positive. Where it goes like that. So it's always sitting above the y axis or the x axis. It never uh, hits it. But sine of x does. So where does um, sine of x actually equal zero? And you can go off of uh, the graph, you can go off the unit circle. Uh, it's not going to matter. Uh, but where would it equal zero? Well, at zero. Why at zero? <clears throat> uh, where's another one? Two pi, but it's not included. Okay. Yes, yeah, so two pi you can't include, uh, but there's another one. Pi over two? Yeah, that's where it's equal to one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's pi pi <clears throat> so on this interval those are the only two zeros so you have two zeros so if you solved it with the equation that's what it would be if you graphed it You know, sign is that wave zero pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, five pi, on and on and on and on. But you can only count zero and pi, so it's just these two. So it's still two solutions. Okay, the trig graphs were pretty, the trig graphs were actually really good. Um, there weren't too many errors in that one other than maybe like an arithmetic type thing, but nothing really stood out. It was like, oh my gosh, the whole class is like not knowing how to do this. Everybody seemed to know what to do. Just there are a couple little mathy errors. Like for example, like eight divided by four, some people put four. Um, just, you know, just because it's a mistake, like everybody does it, even me. <clears throat> okay. And kind of related to that uh, was like question number 17. And it didn't ask you to graph it, it just asked you something about the graph of a function. So one of them was like f of x is equal to 5 tangent x. I think it was a true and false. Yeah, it was a true and false. Yeah. So I so said the amp. Is five and the majority of the class put that it was true. But if you did, <laughs> you missed it because the answer would be false. Why is it false? The tangent and the cotangent graphs don't have amps. 
Yeah, there, there's no amplitude for, for tangent. Uh, why not? Because there's a vertical isentope. <laughs> but what does that mean? Like, what's how does that say, hey, there's no amplitude? I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> so an amplitude is a distance. It's the distance from the highest point on the curve to the lowest. So with tangent, there's no highest because it keeps just shooting up forever and ever. And there's no minimum because it keeps shooting down forever. So in order to have an amplitude, there has to be like a top and a bottom to the curve or to the function in tangent and tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant don't have a top and a bottom. They just keep going up forever and they keep going down forever. So sine and cosine are the only two functions that have an amplitude. <laughs> so if this would have been five sine of x or five cosine of x, then it would be true. But if it's any other function, there's no amplitude in there. No matter how much you want it to, it's just not gonna have one. <clears throat> All right, let's jump down. So I think it was number 22. Is the one with the dot product. So I wanted to know the dot product of u dot v. The other version was v dot w. <clears throat> and there were two issues with this one. One of them was um, people just picked the wrong vectors. Uh, and then the other issue was they didn't know what a dot product was. <coughs> So they just left a blank or skipped it. Okay, so U was 3i plus 6j. And V was 4i minus 9j. So a dot product <clears throat> um, is where you're taking the i coefficients and you're multiplying them together. And then you add it to the product of the J coefficients. So your dot product is always just gonna give you a scalar or just a number. It's not gonna give you a vector. So three times four is 12. Six times negative nine is negative 54. So it gives you a negative 42 as an answer. <clears throat> Okay, so how are you doing with uh, these? Any questions? Okay, uh, let's see, let's do this one. I think it was 35. And it dealt with tangent. Yeah. So if tangent of theta is equal to five, then what is uh, tangent of theta plus tangent of theta plus pi? Oops. 
plus tangent of theta. plus 2 pi. <clears throat> There's a lot of different answers for this one. Um, so to figure out what it is, you got to re remember or know kind of how the values of tangent work. <clears throat> so like, for example, what's uh, tangent of pi over 4? Just on its own. One. One. What's tangent of five pi over four? Also one. Also one. So tangent and cotangent for that matter, they start to repeat their values at every pi with the other functions, sine, cosine, secant, and cosecant they don't really start to repeat their values again until you get to two pi. <clears throat> so if all you're doing is just rotating by pi, then you're getting the same exact result as you did before. So we know tangent of theta is five. Well, if you rotate it around by pi, you're gonna get the same result as you did just like here. So that's another five. And if you rotate another pi, you get right back around to where you started from. Five. So you get a five again. So the total was 15. Uh, oh, actually, I wanted to do another one. I don't really know which number this was because the way Canvas worked, it only it didn't assign numbers to the report I was <laughs> looking at. But you had to evaluate sine of inverse sine of pi over 2. So it was a fill in the, the blank question. <clears throat> and a lot of people put it was pi over two because they're like, oh, sign in inverse sign just cancel out. And a lot of times it does, but in this, this instance, it does not. Um, because in order to evaluate an inverse sign, what has to be true about the number that's in here? Doesn't it has something when it's on the inside it has something to do with the domain? Yeah. So the domain of inverse sine goes from negative one to one. So in order for this to work, whatever number this is has to be from negative one to one. If it's lower than negative one, higher than one, then you can't do it. So pi. That's about 3.14. Well, if you divide that by two, that's now bigger than one. So pi over two is not an acceptable number to plug in the inverse sine. So you can't do it. So it's a B and E. <clears throat> if it was the other way, like if it was that one, this one we can do, and that one would be pi over two. Because pi over two, you can plug it in the sign. <clears throat> so that's good. So they do cancel out. And pi over two is in the range of your inverse sign. So that's totally fine. So if it's if the inverse trig function is the inner function, you got to make sure that whatever number this is, it's in its domain. Because if it's not, then you can't do it. Yeah, and then it's just a B and E. <clears throat> Can we go over one where you have to like adjust like the angle? Um, <clears throat> you mean like the answer? Like it would be like sine neg like inverse sine sine seven pi over four.
Yeah. So this one, it would be totally fine. They would cancel each other out. And the tendency is to put seven pi over four, but seven pi over four is not in the range of inverse sine. So you got to convert it. You have to give an alternate angle that's in the same location. So where is um, seven pi over four? Like what quadrant? First, second, third, or fourth? Not the first two. <laughs> That's not in quadrant one or quadrant two. Uh, it is in quadrant four. Yeah, it's in that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so seven pi over four rotates all the way around to there, but that's not the range of your inverse sine. Inverse sine, <clears throat> when you evaluate it, the range is from negative pi over two to pi over two. So you're just, your angles have to be in quadrant one or quadrant four. So if it's in quadrant four, you just rotate in the negative direction. So that would be negative pi over four is your answer. So that's typically all you really do to convert it. Um, so if you're landing in quadrant four, then you just got to give the negative version of whatever that angle is. So if it was 11 pi over six, what angle would you give as an answer? Negative pi over six. Yeah. And if it was five pi over three, that would convert into a negative pi over three. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, not bad. All right, let me go into exam three and talk about a couple questions in there. Um, and the first one was number 20. And that was the limit as X approaches one from the right. And this is the one that had the LNs in there. So it was like LN of X minus one to the fifth over LN of X minus one. <clears throat> and this one, it, you have to use the properties of the logarithms again. So based on like what we did in from the problems in exam one, uh, like what can you do with that little five? You can put it out in the front. Yeah, you can pull it down. So that'd be five ln of x minus one all over ln of x minus one. And now what can you do that's really, really nice? You can like cancel out the LN things. Yeah, <laughs> LN thingies. <laughs> so yeah, those are gone and there's no other variable in there. So if there's nothing else in there, then it's just whatever that constant is. So it's just five. The other, this was one version. The other versions is basically the same thing. It just had a different exponent. So I think one of them was a nine. Another one might have been a six, but you do it the same way. Just pull it down, then you can cancel them. <clears throat> and you're just left with whatever number it was. <clears throat> now those log properties just kind of keep coming back to haunt you. <clears throat> log properties do not go away. You use them 
uh, in calculus uh, quite a bit. Um, so if you're a little bit rusty on those log properties, you go back and, and look at them. <clears throat> okay, another one that was missed a lot was number 23. And I wasn't quite sure what was happening with this one. So as the limit as X approaches four of ln of X minus three plus two times E to the X minus three. And then all of that was over E to the X minus four. And it was a fill in the blank, so you had to type in a number. And what I saw a lot was a lot of people put D and E. And the only thing I could think of as to why they put that is because they were ignoring the E. And they just thought it was an X minus four down there. Um, because if you plug in the four, and for that X, what is four minus four? Zero. It's zero. And so I think they were either thinking it was zero or E to the Z was zero. Um, but it's not. So if you plug in the four, You do get e to, the z e to the zero in that denominator, but what's e to the zero? One. Oops, I took the limit. It is one. <laughs> so the denominator just cancels out. And then the numerator is now just L of one plus two e. And earlier we talked about what L of one actually is. It's zero. zero. So zero plus two E would just be two E. <laughs> so if your exponent is zero, that's totally fine. Um, unless it's, you can't have zero to the zero. That's not allowed, but any other base is totally fine. Um, so that was the only reason or only thing I could think of as to why people put the DNA. Um, otherwise, I wasn't sure. <laughs> okay. And one of the other questions, and I forget which number it was, this canvas switched it on me. But it was the limit as x approaches uh, zero. Um, one version was from the right, the other was zero from the left. Uh, one over x. So I did see a lot of DNEs on this one. And I think it was because people were plugging in the zero. And they were saying, oh, I've got one over zero, that's a DNE. Which if, if that was all you had, just what is one over zero? You're right, it is a DNA, but this is a limit. So if you're plugging in the number and you're getting a zero in the denominator, don't default to D and E. Uh, there might be something you can do. And most of the time there is something that you can do. You can either manipulate it, um, like kind of what we were doing here with the logs, uh, you can manipulate it algebraically, like you might get things to factor. Uh, but every once in a while, you come across one where you can't do anything to the function. So instead of just going, oh, it's D and E, if you can't manipulate it, graph it. So like, what, is, uh, what does one over X look like? Isn't this like the one that looks kind of like a dot and then it goes off to one way? 
like the square root graphs? Yeah, I, th I think I'm thinking of the square root graphs. <clears throat> so not quite. This is uh, one of our X is the graph that's split in the two pieces. So it has a vertical asymptote of zero. And then one piece is up here in quadrant one. And then the other piece is down in quadrant three. So it's one of those rational functions. So from zero to the right, or from the right, you would trace in from the right, and it's going up to positive infinity. So the other version, if it was zero from the left, instead of being up here, you're down here in quadrant one. So from the left, you're tracing in this way, and now it's just going down forever. So it's going down to negative infinity. So it was not a DNA for where it wouldn't be a DNA is if it was approaching zero from both sides. That is your DNA because your right side and your left side are different. Like you're approaching two different things. In order for a limit to exist, you have to approach the same value when both sides have to go up or both sides have to go down forever. But a lot of times if it's just from the right side or just from the left side, that limit can, can exist because you're just doing the one side, you're not doing both like this one. Okay, and then there was one other question on exam three, and that was the last one. The one that had the, the sum in it. Yeah, it's a theory. Yeah, so there were two of them. There it is. I was going to ask you about that one. <laughs> I got half of it. Yeah, most people got half of it. Like it was usually the front one, um, and it was the the second sum that was uh, giving some issues. Uh, so it was the second sum, and, and all versions had, and it was an n squared over something. 27. Yours was 27? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I remember this one. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't know if I'm doing this right, but. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, the first sum went from 1 to 100. And then this one. I had a four in plus or minus three in there, and then plus. And then this guy went from one to 40. Uh, n squared over 27. So, yeah, most people got the first sum right. Um, so, do you guys want to see it, or do you just want to do the, the second one? The second one. Okay. Does everybody else agree with that or do you want to see the first? Does anybody want to see the first one? Could you, yeah, could you do that? Just really. Good. Sure. <clears throat> so when you're adding or subtracting in the sum, you can split it. Oops. into two separate sums. <clears throat> and then any coefficient, you can always pull out to the front. So that four, you can bring out. And 
and then you can start to evaluate. So the four just stays as four. And then the formula for N Anybody remember that? I think it's like the top number and then like times by the top number minus one over two or something. That's close. I think you said the top number, which was the hundred. That was right. And then you said to minus one. Yeah, one of them has a minus one. Okay. So this is uh, not that one. The last one. Yeah, it's a plus one. In fact, they all have a plus mm -hmm. one. So 100 and 101, and then it's all over two. two. And then minus uh, for this sum for the three, um, if it's any constant, like there's no N or no K or whatever, it's just the constant times that top number. So, all right, to simplify, we do the two into the four twice. And then for the product here, you know, you can multiply in any order you want. So for me, I would go two times 101, because uh, that's usually easy. That's two times 101. Yeah, 202, and then 202 times 100. So 20,200 minus 300 is 19,900. Uh, so most people came up with that. If you didn't, um, one of the errors I saw was some people changed this, this top number to something else. Um, I think that was just by accident. Uh, or they, I don't know, some there was some accidental arithmetic happening. All right, so now let's go on to the, that guy. So we can do the same thing with this one as we just did with that. You can pull any coefficient out to the front. So the one over 27 will just go out here. And then you just have the n squared. So for the n squared, you can use that little formula. And that's kind of the longer one of all of them. So it's just the top number. And then what else? Plus one. Yeah. So just add one to it. And then the third one is you take the number, you double it. So it'll give you 80. And then add one to that to give you 81. And then it's all over six. So this is why that. 1 over 27 was in there. It was to help make your calculations nicer. Um, <clears throat> but a lot of people didn't, <laughs> didn't see it, so it made it worse. Uh, so some people just multiplied all the stuff on top to all the stuff and all the stuff underneath, and then they divided. Well, if you start to divide first, it's a little bit faster because 27 goes into 81 three times. And then you can take the three and take it into the six. And now you can take the two and go into the 40. And so you just now have to multiply 20 and 41 Uh, which would be 820? 
Mm -hmm. Which was a heck of a lot faster than trying to do 40 times 41 and then getting a number and then multiplying that number by 81 and then doing that out and then dividing. Um, <clears throat> so anytime you've got some crazy division multiplication problem set up like this, that's how I would do it. Um, start to divide first and then you can multiply stuff out. So that for your final answer, let's get the total. Take the 19,900 and add it to the 820. And that'll spit out the right answer, which is Twenty thousand seven hundred and twenty. There you go. So the other versions, it was pretty similar. Like they had that denominator in there. <clears throat> so you can just pull the fraction out, and then the same type of thing would happen. This number was going to go into uh, one of these up here, or a combo of two of them. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that wasn't really too bad. You said it kind of, I wasn't sure about breaking it down initially. So right oh. confused, so. Like I was trying to be nice to make it so that the numbers wouldn't be so bad to multiply, but it backfired and made it worse for, <laughs> <laughs> for some people. Shoot. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, um, that was pretty much it from what I saw from the third exam as far as like what were like the major issues were. Everything else was really good. The, the average was, was really great. It was almost an 80. Like once I took out, um, like Canvas might show a different average than what I said it was, um, but Canvas is also taking into account everybody who didn't take the exam who automatically got a zero. So once I eliminated all of those, the average came out to almost an 80. It was like a 79.6, um, which is really high, but really good. <clears throat> so there weren't too many issues with, with this, this one. It's just mainly a couple, couple of those limit ones uh, and this guy. <clears throat> uh, all right. Um, what do you want to ask about? I'm still really worried about those trig identities. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have a specific one, but any of them would be good to go over. Um. Let's try this one. Prove. This might have been a question on exam two, or it was in the study guide. I can't remember where it was, or it's real similar. I think we'll find out. Uh, sign of three theta. over sine theta minus cosine of three theta over cosine <laughs> theta and prove that it equals two. <clears throat> so with the identities, you have to pick one side and one side only. You're, you can't work both sides down to the exact same thing. That's not a complete proof. That's half of one. 
Um, so I mean, you can do that, but you got to then take one of your sides and flip it and then stick it underneath. You got to have a complete crew from start to finish where you're getting the other side as your answer. You're not allowed to move things from side to side. Uh, you cannot multiply something to both sides. Um, <clears throat> you got to pick one side and work with it. So sometimes it's kind of obvious as to which side it is. Um, other times, if it's not obvious, like which one's harder to do, you know, you just got to pick a side and go for it. So with this one, we're going to choose the left-hand side because there's a lot more we can do with this than we can with two. We start with the right side. You'd have to create some magical steps to get you from here to here. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with this one. Um, you, you can look for algebra to do, or you can look for trig identities to do. So with the trig identities, you know, you've got a three theta in here. And it'd be nice if it was just a theta, but you don't have a great identity to, to use when that's an odd number. Um, I mean, we can adjust for it and account for it, but that's going to take a while. So instead of using a trig identity, let's just do some algebra. So the algebra would be with subtracting the fractions. So when you subtract fractions, what do you have to find? Common denominator. Common denominator. So that would just be sine theta, cosine theta. So the sine of three theta is going to get multiplied by the cosine. The cosine of three theta gets multiplied by the sine of theta. And that's about all that we can do algebraically. Um, there really isn't anything algebra wise to do from, from there. Like you can't factor, you could split it, but that would take right back to where it started. Um, there's nothing to foil, there's nothing to distribute. So now we need us to use a trig identity. So we've got one, but we kind of have to use it in reverse. And that is the sign of A minus B formula, that difference formula, is that sine A cosine B minus sine B cosine A. So we actually have this side right here and we're gonna kind of smash it back down into just the one term expression. So we're kind of, we're working it um, backwards in, or in the opposite direction. So in our case, the A is like your three theta and the B is the theta. So when you put it back, just the angle is gonna be three theta minus theta. which now you can subtract because now the inside the angle you have like terms. So that would just be sine of two theta. <clears throat> and we're not close to getting a two yet. So we got to keep going. Um, and again, there's no algebra we can do. You can't cancel anything out. There's nothing to multiply out, factor, or anything like that. So you, you are forced to look for a trig identity. Well, now we've got one that's a little bit more obvious. Sine of two theta, like that is something. Like what can you change it into? Two sine theta, cosine theta. Yeah. Mm 
And that is exactly what we want. Because now the sines are going and the cosines are going. Everything is gone except for the two. <laughs> so if you would have started with the two, it'll work. Um, it would just, your steps would go right in reverse. So you would have had to uh, know that you can multiply by sine and cosine to the top and the bottom, then rewrite into sine two theta, and then take the angle and split it. Use the, I, <laughs> use the formula and then split the fraction. So it's possible, but uh, a bit harder to do. All right, um, let's see, what else do you have a question on? Um, we, my, we could do like one of those like finding the complex zeros, but where you have to do like synthetic division. Okay, pull one up. Yeah, I don't like synthetic division. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lot better than regular division, though. Oh, true, true. Ooh. Which, um, if it tells you, though, that you have to use synthetic division, then you have to use it. If it doesn't say to you that you have to, then, then you can use long division. I don't even remember how to do that one. <laughs> I can only remember how to do the synthetic now. <laughs> I might have pulled it. I did. Uh, Choose that one. Now, are you talking about one that requires synthetic division? <clears throat> Okay, well, it was like, I can do one where it's required or one that's not. One that I have to use. One that you have to use, okay. All right, well, yeah, we'll do a couple things with it. Okay, so let's take f of x and we're gonna let it equal uh, x to the third minus 12x squared minus 69x plus 80. Uh, so we're going to find zeros. Uh, with the rational roots there. Uh, and synthetic division. <clears throat> okay, so now you're forced to use it. So that synthetic division, you're just setting up your polynomials. So you're, you're taking the coefficients and you're gonna line them up right in order. So one, negative 12, negative 69. and 80. And we're trying to pick a number here so that when we go through the synthetic division, this last number becomes a zero. <clears throat> so the number that you can choose in here 
is any factor of the 80 divided by any factor of one. So that's a lot of numbers. It's gonna be like one, two, four, five, and a lot of other ones, uh, as well as the positives and negatives. So I would start low. Uh, I wouldn't start high. <clears throat> So, like what? I kind of feel like with the four, maybe. No, that the might four? be. Okay. I mean, there's only one way to find out if it works, and that's just to try it. So, it's like synthetic division, it's not hard to use. It's just it can be lengthy because you're you're, you're trying to find something that works, and it's and it's easy to make a, a an easy mistake. Like you drop a negative or you add wrong or something. So usually why people don't like it is because it takes a long time to find something or they've just made a simple error that threw everything off. Okay, so let's try the four. So the first number always drops down. And then what do you do with this one here? You multiply it with the four. Yeah, take it, multiply it to that number. And it goes in the next column. And then you just add and subtract down. So negative 12 plus four, so negative eight. And then the process just repeats itself until you get down to this last spot. So negative eight times negative, or negative eight times four is negative 32. And negative 69 minus the 32 would be not gonna. <laughs> what not gonna be this one yeah it's not gonna be this one <laughs> you get like 96 and then yeah so that means you either got the eraser or just since i'm using a pen i gotta redraw it oops we're not gonna use the four Let's try one. So one times one is one. Negative 12 plus one is negative 11. Negative 11 times one is negative 11. Negative 69 minus 11 is negative 80. And negative 80 times one, negative 80 and got a zero. <clears throat> All right, so you found your zero uh, with rational roots theorem and synthetic division, and it's now down to a quadratic. So once you get it down to a quadratic, then you can just factor it. So you're trying to factor x squared minus 11x minus 80, which would be x uh, plus 5 x minus 16. And so your answers would be uh, whatever makes your factors zero, so negative five, 16, and the number that worked in your synthetic division, so the one. <clears throat> so those would be your zeros. And then if it asks you to factor it, <clears throat> it would be the x plus five, x minus 16. Uh, but that's just the quadratic part. You also need the factor from the one. So you'd have an additional x minus one uh, in your uh, factor. Because if you have three different zeros, you should have three different factors. So it could ask you to find the zeros. It could ask you just to factor it. Um, so if it asks you to factor it, then this is going to be your answer. If it just asks for the zeros, then it's just the stuff I boxed. If it wants both, then it's the zeros and the factoring, all of it together. <laughs> OK.
Okay. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. So we're going to add a part B to that. That little question. And that would be graph f of x. <clears throat> so in order to graph f of x, um, you had to have factored it like this. Because that would give you the intercepts. These are your, your intercepts here. <clears throat> so that was a fun little way to see if anyone had really cheated because there were a couple of people that just did part B. Like they graphed it, but they didn't do any of this. So I was like, how'd you know where the zeros were? <clears throat> All right, so it's an X to the third and it's positive. So its shape is gonna be like an N. So something like that. And you just gotta draw it through your intercepts. So the negative five, the one, and the 16. Oops. And again, this does not have to be to scale. <clears throat> and it wanted all intercepts, so you also have to give the y intercept. So you can just plug in zero uh, into x, and you can use the factored one, or you can go up to the original. To use the original is probably easier because if you stick in a zero, it'll knock any of those x's out, and you're left with just 80. All right, so there's the graph. And then part C. Where is f of x greater than or equal to zero? <laughs> so this, you could go off of the factors and do that little sign chart. Or you could go off of your graph and just give where anywhere where the graph is above the x axis. So if I have the graph, I'm going to use that because I just have to look at it. So it's above the x axis. On that hill and then this section up here. So anything that was in green. So that's going from negative five to one. And then from 16 to infinity. And then you have to decide if you're gonna get parentheses or brackets. So the infinities always get a parenthesis. <clears throat> what about these numbers? Are they gonna get brackets, parentheses, uh, combo? brackets yeah they're gonna get brackets because you've got that equal bar Hmm. All right, um, let's see, I've got time for one more question, uh, but Kiara, you can't ask one. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> like, you've asked your quota. So I guess if no one else has one, then you could ask one, but.
Does anyone have anything? Um, well, we have parametric equations on the final. Um, you could. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I mean, there are uh, fair game. Anything that was on any of the three study guides or the exams is, um, is fair game. Uh, so the parametric equations, yeah, I could ask something from, from those. And, and it could be... Um, ones where like you're given the parametric equations and you have to graph it with the orientation or it could be like one of those projectile motion ones uh, where you have to get the parametric equations and then use stuff about it like what is the maximum height of the ball type stuff um yeah there was one on exam three. Um, hold on. I got most of it. I think there was only one of the questions where I was very lost on. Uh, was it the projectile motion one or the graph? The, no, the projectile motion. <clears throat> where President Biden kicks the ball. Yeah, yeah. I think possibly what threw me off a little bit was um, that he started on the ground. Oh, okay, so if you start on the ground, what's the height? Zero. Zero. Yeah. Okay. Where was that? Maybe I didn't get it wrong. Um, my question was for C, it stated, when is the second time the soccer ball reaches a height of 84 feet? Okay. Um, what question number was that? Um, 13. 13? Oh, that's why. Oh, yep, there it is. Um, <clears throat> the second time reaches a height of 84. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want to make sure I've got the right version. It's like they were all pretty much this. It was the same scenario. Just <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So yours was, um, it had an initial speed. Uh, 160? Yes. Yeah. And your theta was 30 degrees. <clears throat> okay, and you're asking about part C? Mm hmm Okay. <clears throat> so for C, and this would be true for the other uh, versions as well. You're taking your, your y equation and you're setting it equal to uh, whatever value it gave you. So right. in your case, it would be the 84. So um, what was your what was your y equation mm. from part A? I think I have it written down. Or not part A, just in general. <laughs> um. It would be y equals negative 16 t squared. Um, <clears throat> it's that middle number. Hold on. Um, let's just work it out just in case. 
So it would be negative. So the formula would be negative one half uh, g t squared. <clears throat> oh, plus a d t. Okay. Um, plus the v zero sine of theta times t <clears throat> plus your height. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's where she's getting her numbers from. So the g in this case was what? Approximately 32 feet. 32. Uh, what's the other value g could be? Because sometimes it's 32 and sometimes it's another. Mm, or 9.8. Yeah, the 9.8 meters. Yeah, so it depends on your unit. So since we're in feet, we have to use the 32, but if it was in meters, then we use the 9.8. <clears throat> okay, your initial speed was 160. Your angle was 30 degrees. And since it's on the ground, the height was zero. Okay, now what's a uh, sign of 30? Um, a half. A half. And then so a half times 60 is, your, is the 80. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's your, your Y. So to get part A, you would have had to get this one. Um, so part A, you set it equal to zero in solve for T. And part C, you're gonna set it equal to 84. And solve for t. So since it said the second time, that means you're going to get two answers. <clears throat> and then you're going to pick the larger one of the two. So to solve it, we got to set this thing equal to zero. So you got to move the 84 over to the uh, to the left, uh, or you can move everything else and put it on the right. Um, either way. So if you move everything left, now you've got a quadratic equation to solve. And to make it a little easier, uh, you can divide out what's common uh, just to make your numbers a little bit smaller. You don't have to, but that helps if you do. So like what number goes into all three of these? What's the biggest one that goes into all of them? Four, right? Yeah. So we're going to divide everything by four. And we're going to divide them all by negative four just to get this to be a positive. So 4t squared minus 20t plus 21. And then from here, you could factor or use the quadratic formula, or you could complete the square if you wanted. Um, I would try factoring, and if it doesn't work, then I would go to the formula, uh, but that's just me. <clears throat> So let's do 2t uh, minus 7 and 2t minus 3. Because if you foiled this, that's what's going to give you the negative 20. Because that gives you negative 14. And these would give you negative 6. And that totals to negative 20. <clears throat> if you use a quadratic formula, you're going to get the same answer as what we do here. So then your solutions would be uh, 3 over 2, and then 7 over 2. So we're going to pick that one, because that's the second time the ball reaches a height of 84 feet. And it's the second time because he's kicking it, and the ball goes up, and then it has to come back down. 
So it's hitting 84 once on the way up, and then it hits it again on the way back down. Because <clears throat> part A, or sorry, part B was like, what's the maximum height? And that answer was 100. So it hits 84 on the way up and goes up to 100 feet and then it falls back down. So it hits 84 a second time. So that'd be your seven over two. If it asks where does it hit up the first time on the way up, then you would choose the three over two. Um, so does that answer your question? Yes, perfect. Okay. Do you, you know what? Do you know what it was where you made a mistake? Um, yeah, I think it was uh, the factoring kind of messed me up, but mm. I understand like the whole concept. Of <laughs> okay. <right now. laughs> oh, good. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, there are a lot of different techniques on how to factor something like this. What I see a lot of, um, especially in high school, um, a lot of that curriculum out there has you um, doing something like this. And then you're figuring out numbers and then you're multiplying things together. Like this is an okay, if you're using something that looks like this, it's an okay method to use if there's no number in front of the, the T squared or the X squared. If there is, then it's not so great to use because it creates um, an issue that you have to know how to deal with. And for whatever reason, they either gloss over it in high school or they don't teach it, one of the two. Um, and so I don't like using this method at all. Um, I would teach other stuff. One's called a slide and divide. Um, the other one is just brute force. And this is just going straight to here. Um, but you can look up slide and divide is a pretty nifty way to do it. It's like, and it's been a while since I've taught it. So I don't want to show you something that would be wrong. <clears throat> uh, but if you just look into YouTube, just type that in there. It, there's a lot. Um, there's a really nifty way to factor if you just can't factor something like that easily into here. <clears throat> and when I taught like Math 100 or Algebra 1, people like that way better than this. Yeah. Yeah. High school, it seemed to they like overcomplicated it a lot. Yeah. And I think that's another reason why people forget how to use it or they just want to magically not <laughs> care about the, that issue um, but it throws it if it's if there's a number in front of it. <clears throat> yeah there were so many methods that sometimes um the, the people would mix the methods up yep mm -hmm. like do some yeah with like the factoring do that x method with another method yeah yeah uh, yeah, that. Uh, uh, I always thought uh, like by the first and the last number, and then mm -hmm. see like what you can get, like what factors like equal the middle number. Yeah, but there's some issue that can get created in there if you're not careful, um, and so it throws off your factoring. And I think what it is is they just want to not factor this number and so they put forward one. So like, well, it's not always that, it could be a two and a two. <clears throat> so yeah, but anyways, that's my little soapbox about that. <clears throat> okay, well, that is all the time I've got. Um, but you can certainly ask me questions um, you know, just send it to me via email and I'll uh, get back to you. If you didn't catch it in the announcement I made yesterday, um, 
there is no like separate study guide for the final because you are, already have three of them. Um, so you have the study guides. Uh, you also have the three exams. So we go through those. Um, if you still want more material to study off of, you can hit the quizzes uh, and then the notes uh, followed by the homework. So you've got a lot uh, of material to study from without having me to give you more. <clears throat> Do our tests be like a mixture of multiple choice and written questions, or is it just going to be mostly written questions? It, it'll have the same format as the other exams. Uh, so it'll have a multiple choice section. Um, it'll have fill in the blank. May, uh, I think there's some true and false. Um, and then the last part would be where the uh, the free response section is. I'm trying to get all the free responses together in a group so you're not having to like flip back and forth between the different types of questions. Um, hopefully that works out better. <clears throat> but it, it should look pretty similar to, um, or the format wise, like um, definitely how the last exam was. Okay. How long will we have on the final? Uh, same as the other ones. Uh, yeah. And I, I don't write 100 question finals either. Like the length of the exam will be um, probably a little bit longer than an exam, but not, not by much. Um, I don't need to ask 100 questions. It's, no. <laughs> Yeah, why does our exam say it's only 18 questions? Because that's not being, I, I, I'm still writing it. <laughs> <laughs> so there's more to come. <clears throat> so it's about probably halfway through. So we have a little there's bit more. Time. There's 55 points accounted for. <clears throat> and we have like a little bit more time than a regular test, right? No, you still have the three hours. Okay. <clears throat> if this was an in-person class, you'd actually have less time than you would uh, for a regular exam. Because <clears throat> a normal class time is two hours and 20 minutes, but for finals, it's an hour and 50. <clears throat> so you guys kind of luck out. <laughs> <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> yeah, if, if you study the study guides and the exams, you should be looking pretty good for the final. Um, so if you have questions on any of them, um, just, just let me know. Um, and I'll help you as much as I can. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Um, and if we don't talk to you, thank you for the semester. Oh, you're welcome. It's been a good semester. I've enjoyed it, even though I haven't seen you <laughs> in person. I wish I could, but you take care. Good day. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. See you guys later. Bye, Bye Professor. Bye. I had a question. <laughs> uh, sure. Let me. Well, there it is.